International Expeditions is pleased to be bringing you this webinar. We are here to talk about the Galapagos. And I'd like to start by turning it over to our first guest speaker this evening, Emily Harley. Welcome, Emily. Well, thank you so much, Lee, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight to talk about my very favorite place in the world, the Galapagos Islands. This is a photo from uh, Gardner Bay Beach, which is one of the spots we visit, and I always laugh and say, you know, one of the very first things our naturalists do when you arrive in Galapagos is warn you, don't touch the animals. They do not give the animals the same speech when they uh, when they see you. So you're apt to get a curious sea lion coming up and putting its head in your lap, or coming up and playing with your snorkel when you're underwater. Um, and that really is one of the things that sets the Galapagos Islands apart. Again, my name is Emily. I'll be answering your questions tonight. I have been with International Expeditions for 10 years, and I'm also in my second term serving as the vice president of the International Galapagos Tour Operators Association. We're a group that helps to raise awareness and funds for conservation and sustainability efforts in the Galapagos Islands. I'm also really excited to introduce to you uh, Rick Griffin, who is a fantastic writer and storyteller. And I'll be telling you just a bit more about him in a moment. But we really wanted to take the opportunity you know, to go beyond what you could see on our website or brochures and really talk to Rick about his experiences. I think you're going to have a fantastic time. And I'd also like to point out that almost without exception, every photo used tonight was taken during Rick's journey to Galapagos a little bit earlier this year. So just a few quick things about why International Expeditions Galapagos Voyage is so extraordinary. Um, as you may know, we are on the 32 guest yacht, the MV Evolution. Now, what you'll find with International Expeditions is that when you travel on one of our small groups, you have three expedition leaders with you. Uh, and we divide onto smaller boats. So when you're exploring the islands, you're in very small groups, usually less than 10 people, with your expedition leader. So you get a fantastic, intimate, and immersive look at what all is going on around you. Of course, all of our activities are guided by level three naturalists, which is the very highest level offered by the Galapagos National Park. Our ship has the largest cabins and the most public space of any yacht in its class in Galapagos, and is just ideally sized for exploration. And of course, as a company, International Expeditions has 35 years of experience in providing nature-focused travel that looks at the entire environment. Yes, it's the wildlife and the landscapes and the fauna, but it's also the people and how we interact with those environments that just make our opportunity to explore so special. So of course, tonight we are here to talk about the Galapagos. Let's see if I can get my slide advanced. There we go. So just a little bit of, uh, there's our ship, the Galapagos Islands, and just a little bit of reference for you so that you can see the places that we're going to talk about tonight. The Galapagos Islands um, are an archipelago located right on the equator, 600 miles off the coast of South America. International Expeditions offers two different itineraries um, that will explore a variety of islands, but both experiences um, really take in a variety of fascinating sites. So you can always find more detail on the exact itinerary with two different options that we offer by small ship on our website at ietravel.com. Um, and, and you know, any of our staff is happy to talk to you about Galapagos. So now I want to introduce the person who you really want to listen to tonight, Rick Griffin. Rick is an acclaimed writer and storyteller, 
um, and travel personality who has appeared on CBS, uh, USA Today, Forbes. He's one of Reuters' uh, most influential travel personalities on Twitter and just has a whole host of other accolades to go with him. Rick is the host of Midlife Road Trip, which is a website devoted to you know, fulfilling your life list travel destinations and experiences. So Rick, um, I'm ready to hand this over to you. And I just wanted to ask, you know, you've traveled extensively in Europe and the Caribbean and, and around the world. When does the Galapagos Islands really make it onto your must-see list? <laughs> well, first, Emily, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this because uh, I'm probably more passionate about the Galapagos Islands than any trip that I've ever taken. This is by far the most memorable trip that I've ever been on. Um, you know, I've been traveling professionally for, gosh, almost six years, and I've never really given the Galapagos much thought. You know, I have a little confession. Um, I learned enough about the Galapagos when I was in like ninth grade to pass the test. You know, I knew that um, it had something to do with Charles Darwin and the uh, little finches, but uh, <laughs> that, that was about all. Um, but after hanging out with other travelers and talking to them, and you know, we always, the conversation is like, what's been the most exciting trip or best trip you've ever been on? And time and time again, more, I kept hearing the Galapagos, and then I was seeing people's pictures. So um, really, it's just been like within the last four or five years that it was on my bucket list. And the more I learned, the more I wanted to go and experience that. Um, let's see, oh, there's a picture of one of the Galapagos finches right there. Um, you know, I was thinking if my ninth grade teacher had mentioned that Darwin saw boobies, I may have been more interested in the Galapagos at the time. Okay, here we go. Here's, um, whoops, I, I think I advanced two slides at, at one time. Is there a way to go back? I don't know how to do that. Um, one of the things that, like you were saying, Emily, is that the animals will sometimes come up to you. This is a picture I shot on Mascara Beach. Um, these two ladies were standing behind a sea lion and the, the, had their picture made, and they were talking to whoever was taking the picture, and as soon as they were saying something, this sea lion did this little back arch, <laughs> to look at them, and it, it was just funny. Uh, they're really funny, playful, playful critters. Um, here's a picture of some crab. The, I think these are the Sally Lightfoot crab. They're so colorful. You see them against the black lava rock, scurrying around, and um, it's just just a lot of fun to just to see these guys. Um, they're the ones that are probably a little more afraid of you than anything else on the islands. I would, uh, I took this one with my cell phone, and right before they ran, kind of hit up under the rock. But it's the the colors are just just amazing. There. Um, one thing you know, I didn't really know when I came what to prepare for when visiting the Galapagos, as far as Photography, you know, I'm a semi-professional photographer. I take pictures for a lot of my blog posts. And so I brought this great big, like, 30-pound zoom lens to take pictures, and I, I really didn't need it. I, I recently um, published um, a series of photos for Expedia's Viewfinder blog on the Galapagos. And of the 10 or 12 pictures that I took, almost all of them were with my cell phone. <laughs> So um, so you don't really need that because you can get up pretty close to the animals and um, they're, for the most part, happy to see you. They're curious about you, as, about as curious as you are of them. Um, let's see. Trying to figure out where we are on here. Let's see what's the next slide. Oh, this is one of my favorites. There we go. This is a red-footed booby, a mama booby and her baby. And I was, you know, probably two and a half feet from them. I just, that's a cell phone picture right there. Um, it's just amazing how, how close they are. Yeah, I couldn't imagine getting that close to any kind of bird here in the, the U.S. Um, and without them freaking out, especially a mama. You know, it would be pecking my eyes out or something. 
But um, she just sat there with her baby and let us take pictures of her. Um, I didn't know before I went that there were, I think the Galapagos Islands have three different kinds of boobies. Um, there's the red-footed booby and, of course, the famous blue-footed booby, and then they have the Nazca booby, which is um, kind of a mask booby. And they're beautiful animals, especially to watch them fly, but they're really downright hilarious to, to watch them walk. They kind of wobble like a penguin, and um, that's something that you'll you definitely want to see. The, bir the birds, they're just amazing. They're things you will not see, I guess, anywhere else in, in the world. Um, here's some frigates, and these are big birds. I mean, uh, their wingspan is, you know, like six or seven feet long. These are particular ones. Um, I have better close-up photos, but I wanted to show this one. These are some male frigates. Uh, of course, one of them's got his chest puffed out because, you know, he's trying to pick up chicks. That's what male frigates do. They, you know, show off the other guy over there on the, the left side. Um, he needs, like, some frigate Viagra or something. But um, I guess he got tired of showing off or, or something. Um, or maybe he wasn't attracted to the female that was in the area. Um, the birds are beautiful to look at, but um, one thing... Be glad you don't have a scratch and sniff feature on your, your computer right now. This These beautiful rocks are actually just covered with uh, bird poop. And they you can smell it well before you get to it. I, I guess maybe they have a nice little place that they like to go. I don't really totally know the story behind that. But Emily, you may know something. Do you have any insight onto the, the birds? <laughs> I think she's got herself muted right now. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> there my, <is>. apology. <laughs> my apologies. My I, apologies. I, I do not have any insight into the uh, restroom habits of birds, but I'm glad you included this because it is something that um, we always laugh about. You, you know, when you look through brochures and you see these gorgeous photos or through a wildlife uh, calendar, you do not realize exactly how much Photoshop had to go into making a brochure worthy. <laughs> For sure, were these photos. Um, and Rick, you kind of touched on some of the things that you always see um, when you think about the Galapagos Islands or when you see the pictures that people bring you back, whether it's the sea lions, uh, the giant tortoises, of course. But when you and I talked about this trip, there were several animals that you mentioned finding particularly fun to photograph. I wondered if you would talk to us about those experiences. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, let's see. I think the next slide here will show um, one. Uh, there we go. Uh, I love the sea lions just because they're so playful and so funny. This particular photo, this was um, actually a this, the baby sea lion had his head, his or her head, rested on the mother. And um, she, the baby started to raise up, and um, it puked on mom's head. So then mom jumped up, and I snapped the photo. And there it is with the little baby sea lion throw up right on her head. And then after a minute, she didn't wipe it off or anything. She just kind of laid back down. Um, these guys are just extremely cute and fun to photograph. Um, they do smell a little bit. That was one thing I wasn't prepared for um, because the photographs, you don't really pick that up. But um, you don't notice after a little while because it's so much fun photographing them. Um, let me move on to the next slide here. There we go. Uh, this is a blue-footed booby with an iguana just walking behind it. That's just not uncommon to see. The animals seem to get along with each other, and it's just uh, like an, another day at rush hour on, on the Galapagos there. Uh, they are um, they're, they're funny, funny animals. Um, we have a video on our website, uh, it's actually the blue-footed boobies uh, mating, but just their little mating ritual and the dance that they do beforehand is is just hilarious. Um, that alone is worth the trip to the Galapagos if, if you're a wildlife lover. And the uh, name booby actually comes from their comical behavior. It's uh, an adaptation of the Spanish word uh, that sort of means clown or fool. Um, I did not know that. I did not know that. I'm glad to know. <laughs> that is funny. 
Um, another thing that was really fascinating to me was the number and the variety of iguana out there. The, they're very colorful. There's some of them that are very bland and just blend right into the rocks. But um, if you're a little squeamish, sometimes you may be freaked out by them at first. But um, they'll let you get up pretty close to photograph them. But um, they'll kind of look at you and then just go on about their business. Um, let's see. I think we have several pictures of of some. That's a marine iguana. That they are just ugly. They look like they're some kind of space creatures. And but um, just to show you again a little bit of the variety of them um, and the, just the little spiky things on top of their heads. And uh, I, I I don't know why my wife thinks I'm kind of weird for enjoying photographing iguanas so much, but um, they're fun. This is a I don't remember which island this was, but um, they were everywhere. Just uh, this is like one, two, three, four, five, like five or six in this picture right here. But um, that's actually cropped. If you zoomed out, you could probably see about twelve in it. Um, but you wouldn't be able to see them quite uh, up close. But um, it, it's just amazing just to, to see see them. We were on their territory for sure. Uh, See where's the, oh this little guy whoops went back can you go back I don't know how to go back on this sorry thank you yeah this this guy he was I don't know if he was hiking his leg at me or or what but I just walked up to take a picture at him usually they just kind of sit there and he decided to hike his leg I don't know if he's wanting to high five me or wet on me or or what but I snapped the picture and moved on and let him go about his business um, I think he was shunning the paparazzi then that may have been it. <laughs> Um, this is Bowley, one of our naturalist guides, and if you are squeamish about these things, the, he was so good about taking pictures for people. Um, you know, just they would give him his cell phone, and um, he'd be glad to get some down, some kind of weird angle, and get some really good pictures. He was doing it himself too, because he loves it and is fascinated by it. But that's one of the things that I really loved and appreciated about the guides on the trip. Things like that. Um, let's see what's our next penguins. Did you know? I did. I had no idea there were penguins in the Galapagos. I thought penguins were these cold weather animals. And on this trip, we we crossed the equator twice, so I was not expecting to see penguins at all. So this was really kind of uh, a cool experience to to get to see these guys up close. And there, there's Bowley getting a, another iguana, uh, and then another kind. I think that's on uh, South Seymour Island, and that was a pretty big guy right there. Now, Rick, you've already kind of talked to us about some of the animals that you didn't necessarily expect to see, like penguins. Um, but talk to us about some of the other experiences on the trip. What were some of your favorite moments, things that really surprised you about the Galapagos? Well, you know, one of the things that um, I would, I love our daily activities. Um, every day we would uh, have a hike and usually a scuba dive. And I'd never been scuba diving before. So seeing a Snor lot of... Snorkeling. I'm sorry? Snorkeling. Snorkeling, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> but snorkeling. But I had never been snorkeling before either. And uh, um, what was really cool about that, they... They give you a great um, a briefing on you know what's going to happen, how to do it. You wear these wetsuits that that keep you afloat, and so you're able to go down in the water and take photos of some amazing wildlife. Here's a turtle that I was able to to get. Um, you know I, I didn't think we would see them up close like this, but I mean we were able to to swim along beside them. It's like you've got your little friend there that you can just hang out with. Um, now, the guides, uh, like Bowley was really good about if he saw a starfish or something, you know, down deeper, he would he would take your camera if you wanted him to, and he would swim a little deeper to get a good picture for you. And um, I tried to, to dive first because I'm, I'm a pretty good swimmer, but I haven't been snorkeling. But these suits keep you afloat, so I kept trying to dive, and I never could. Uh, finally, by the end of the trip, I was able to, to do that. But... Um, that was um, 
I, I, that's now become one of my favorite things. This the snorkeling is just uh, to see what's underneath the water because it's a it's a totally different world, and, and just the we saw lots of starfish, just the different kinds um, things that you you won't see anywhere else. Uh, we saw sharks, and in fact, one day I was um, snorkeling. This is that towards the end of the trip, and we saw several hammerhead sharks, probably six or eight of them, they were just swimming somewhere, they're probably 30, 40 feet away from us, and of course I wanted a picture, so I had my GoPro and I was wanting to um, capture a little bit of video of it, and so I'm starting to do my dive because I learned how to do that, and just shortly after that you can see the footage of it, I'm kind of swimming back towards the top, I remembered that I had cut my leg against some of the, um, some of the lava a little bit earlier in the day, and I, I decided it probably wasn't a good idea to chase hammerheads with a bleeding leg, and that was totally my fault. I went to, I was chasing some other little fish or turtle or something and got too close when the guides had told us to stay away from that area, and um, I did, but um, it, my wife kind of makes fun of me on, the, on that particular video for that. Um, but the, the fish are so colorful and amazing, it just like that's some sushi stuff right there, um, but you just kind of swimming right there among them, and it's uh, just a, a peaceful, peaceful experience. Um, even if you've never snorkeled before, just have confidence in that wetsuit and try to relax. At first, I was kind of swimming and paddling and figuring I had to do all this stuff to to keep afloat and was nervous, but uh, it's after. A little while, um, it's very, very easy. And you've been, right? You've been snorkeling, right, Emily? Yes. Um, I had been snorkeling previously in Hawaii and some other um, Caribbean destinations. But, of course, what you get in the lava is completely different. Um, as you said, you, know, you always feel like you have a friend with you. Uh, and I think that that was something that surprised me the most about Galapagos. It's not just that the wildlife is very calm and it's you know, disinterested in you. The wildlife seems, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, genuinely curious about you. So again, uh, penguins and sea lions, sort of, they'll come up and investigate uh, wh why are you in my environment? The, the sea turtles as well, um, you know, they'll swim slowly by you, um, and it really was a different experience, and especially as someone, you know, who really is passionate and loves wildlife, it's, it's an incredible experience. Yeah, like the, the sea lions, um, they would, you're trying to take a picture of them, they're swimming all around you, and then you're like, where'd it go, where'd it go, and then you look here, it, it came behind you and circling you again, I mean, it's just... They're so playful and, and so much fun. It's uh, I can't wait to go again. I want to want to do that soon. Um, this here's a picture of two of the blue-footed boobies, and you can see the, the picture in the lower um, left down there. People are taking pictures of these guys. This these are the ones we caught on tape. We caught it our booby sex tape, um, where they were doing their kind of little waddling dance and. It's just, they're just funny, just funny. But that, that's probably one of my favorite pictures uh, from, from the entire trip. Um, we learned a little bit, and Emily, I'm sure you probably did this as well, in the Galapagos Post Office. Um, this is a place on, what was the island? Emily, do you remember the name of this one? I know. I've um, it is, it's on Floriana. Oh, okay. And anyway, people from whoever visit the islands, they would put their, their mail in their address. Um, they, uh, International Expeditions had us address a, something to ourselves. And then when somebody comes to the island, they'll look through the mail. And if they're from, see any mail from their particular area, you take it with them and you're supposed to hand deliver it back. So it may be years before you get something back, uh, your postcard to yourself. And I just got my, I, I was there in February in the Galapagos, and I was out of town, but somebody had delivered my Galapagos postcard to me, um, I think it was back in, in August. So that was kind of cool <laughs> that, that they really did that. Um, 
you're supposed to deliver it in person. Of course, I wasn't at home, so they just stuck it in my mailbox, but there's no postmarks. They didn't cheat and mail it to me or anything. And I, I had written on my postcard, uh, please come back soon, <laughs> So, because I was already wanting to come back by the, the time I've been there. Did you do that, Emily? Did you um, get any your back? I know you went before I did. Um, no one ever actually returned my letter to me, but I um, I got to pick up a postcard from someone who uh, lived fairly close by, and, and 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 drop it off with them. So it's a it, it seems a little silly, but it really is a fun chance to sort of just meet someone, even if for a minute, and and have a, a nice moment to talk about Galapagos. Just to, to meet a fellow world traveler. Yeah, because you know I have it. It's hard to talk about it to somebody who's never been. It's you know I don't feel my words or uh, my photographs really do it justice. It's something that you've got an experience. So I was disappointed that I I wasn't at home and didn't get to meet the person. I don't know who it was. You know that had been there, and I could have you know we could have shared shared about it, but. Um, it's still a, a cool concept. I, I like that. So if you go, be sure and address yourself a, a letter at the Galapagos Post Office. Um, something else, I, I love the, the sea turtles. You know, I, I fell in love with them in the water, and um, Bowley took us out to a place where they uh, lay their eggs and nest. And these are sea turtle tracks uh, from their nest coming back to the sea. And um, I don't know, Emily. What time of year? You know what time of year they the, they hatch and actually head down back to the sea? Um, well, it's various times depending on the species. Um, you know, the most prominent sea turtles that you'll see in Galapagos in the water are the green sea turtles. But you know, that's the great thing. You know, one of the questions we always get about Galapagos is what's the best time of year to go. And the fact is, there's always something nesting or being born or uh, you know coming, and and it's it's a fantastic destination, especially if you love seeing babies because there are there's some kind of baby almost year round. Well, yeah, as we saw with the baby boobies, and we saw baby frigates, and and it's um, just just if you love nature at all, it's it's paradise. Um, something else that we did, uh, I can talk on the ship, um, we had some live entertainment. Um, I think Bowley or somebody had arranged for through a local school there uh, or uh, in Galapagos to come out and they did this dance and sang and played music. I bought one of their CDs. I don't understand a single word on it, but it, was, it brings back great memories. So this was something that we did um, after dinner, I think, on the, the last night. But these girls were dancing, and it's so colorful and, and so much fun. Is that something that they do on most of the trips, or was that just special because I was there? No. no. Uh, well, you are very special. But, no, this is actually <laughs> something that we do on every journey. Um, well, Dawn, and, and I was hoping it was <laughs> And of course, Galapagos is not some place that you immediately think of for culture. But I know, um, Rick, there are several opportunities that you had to meet locals, including a particular farming family who um, have a have something fun that they do in the Highlands on the way to and from uh, where you go see giant tortoises. Oh yeah, that, that was so much fun. The the farm up there. Let's see. Um, see so if we can get to the the picture. Is that where we are next? Let's see. Um, no, I think next is the uh, is the Charles Darwin Research Station. Oh, okay. All right. Which cool. you can talk about, but you can talk about the farm first if you so desire. Okay. No, no. We'll, we'll, let's go ahead and talk. Uh, Charles Darwin Research Station is here, so we'll do that, and then we'll just move on back into the farm. I think those pictures are are coming up. But um, this was a really fascinating place where they're. Um, and I know you're on the board here, right, Emily? The, the um, I'm, yeah, so I work with the International Galapagos Tour Operators Association. I'm on their board. And one of our major projects that we work with is the Charles Darwin Research Station. Uh, most people know that the government of Ecuador established the research station 
but they don't fund it in any way. So one of the things that we really work with uh, the Charles Darwin Foundation to do is to help improve visitor experience, help raise money. Uh, we help fund various projects that they are uh, working with and the scientists that they work with. Yeah, and what I, I like seeing there, which I know you've got these um, turtle hatcheries and you've got these turtles in all different stages of development, and it's amazing to see these little guys that you know you can hold in your hand grow up to be something that you can ride on if you want to tell me they're uh, such huge, huge turtles. Let's see, where's our little guy's picture? There they are. There they are, and um, you know they're they're a lot more than what you can see in this photograph, but these are just these are three or four little cute guys huddled together. And that's what kind of, this is them fast forward 60, 70 years. <laughs> and um, this is a different species than they had at the farm. Is that correct? Yes. So the Charles Darwin Research Station actually has um, several different species of um, the tortoises because as you may or may not know or, or other people listening may or may not know, the, um, the, the tortoises differ island to island. They have different uh, shell shapes, they feed on different vegetation, um, but something that's particularly exciting, um, just recently for the first time in, gosh I want to say it was 75 plus years, there have been baby tortoise, baby giant tortoises now documented as being born in the wild. Uh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So it's not just the ones that are hatched here. They are in the wild now. That's, oh, wow. And you know what? They may have told me that when I was there. And, you know, I, I kind of wander off to take pictures sometimes. So I'm, I sometimes miss part of what the, the guides tell me because um, it's just so fascinating. It's like a, the whole experience, you're like a kid in a candy shop just wanting to wonder, oh, I want to get a picture of this, I want to get a picture of that, and um, it's just just amazing. I think um, the next picture is actually at the farm. Yeah, this is at the farm, and you see a lot of these guys just roaming around everywhere, and they have a shell of one that died, and you can see down in the bottom right, I crawled in that just to kind of give you a sense of perspective of, of how big these things really are. Um, though they, you have to kind of sneak up on them. But, um, they do seem to be a little bit shy. <laughs> they kind of go into their shell, <laughs> so you want to you know, get a picture of them um, quietly. Um, I think our guides were found one that was, you know, had his head up, and everybody could take turns kind of walking behind it, and um, they would take our pictures with them, with the turtle in the picture. And um, this next slide is one that, there he is. I got, I got a million pictures of him. In fact, I took so many pictures that I came back, my camera actually weighed more than when I left home <laughs> with it. it. It's just, oh gosh. But I uh, got this guy with his mouth open. He was just eating some grass there. And um, I, I followed him around a while. I, I kept a good respectful distance, didn't, you know, wanting to go in a shell or, or hide, so I, I just kept snapping away and finally got him a good shot with his, with his mouth open there. I'm just curious, Rick, if you could talk about the difference, um, because in the same day you get to see the, the captive tortoise breeding program as well as going out into the wild to see the tortoises. Can you talk about um, sort of that experience and, and how seeing them on the same day uh, you know, was that something important to you to see both in the wild and in captivity? Yeah, well, well naturally you want to see them in, in the wild if you can because that's their natural habitat. But then I really appreciated after seeing, in the order that we did it, seeing them in the wild first and then seeing the efforts that the, the center is doing to, to bring back the species and to breed them and to, you know, have more of them. So I, I think both were important. I think it's it's good both ways, and to get to see both, you know, a couple of different species um, was really good. I remember just going up to the, the the farm where these guys were. It was um, 
you would just see them on the side of the road sometimes, <laughs> you know, just walking along by, by a pasture or something. So um, that was kind of cool. You know, that's not something you, you see every day. Uh, you know, most turtles you have to, to worry about. You don't want to kill it if you hit it with your car. This one you're worried about totaling your car if one of these guys <laughs> hit them. But uh, it was really just just amazing. Now, before we move on to talk about the boat, I want to go back to talk about the farm that you visit when you're coming back down from the highlands, because I know okay. you found that particularly fun. Uh, you talking about? I, I know we don't have any pictures of that, do we? The, you talking about the uh, the coffee? I don't believe we have any photos now. Okay. Yeah, um, no. But um, it's a. It's, it's a great family-run farm, and and not only do they produce sugar cane, you also have a chance to see a coffee farm. But then the uh, farmer, uh, I'll let you take over from there about what else the farmer produces, Rick. Um, I'm trying to think which what it was. He uh, had, if you. If you if you visit the same farm I did, he actually produces small batch moonshine. Okay, no, I did that. Okay, I did not know that. So now I feel cheated, Emily. I need to go back. I need to <laughs> Galapagos moonshine. No, or, or maybe you had it, but um, we didn't see it then, or didn't hear it, or I was taking pictures, like something that I, I tend to do. Um, there's also, we went up to a big crater up there, which was just, Huge. I, um, I don't remember the name of it, but it was just a spectacular view. I, I got a good panoramic uh, shot of that, but it, it wouldn't really be conducive for this show, this slideshow. But um, it was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. You could just see so far and then so deep into the crater. Um, I love. Bowley was really good, just telling us about the volcanic formations of the islands. That, as a, whole, as a whole, um, we went through a lava tube, which was cool. I've never done that before. So, uh, and that was right near where the turtles were. So uh, that was all. That was all a great day. Let's see here, I'm going to take back over here just a moment, and you know, even though we're talking about the experiences you had, really one of the um, what everyone always says really makes the trip are your guides and the crew. Of course, as I already pointed out with international expeditions, um, your small group of, of 26 or 26 to 32 has the very best guest to guide ratio in the islands, but this crew just takes such fantastic care of you. Um, your, your cabin is so well kept. The food is incredible. Um, and thankfully, you got a few shots of the food. Um, but then uh, the guides that we have, like Bowie, um, who's here on the right, and Alex on the left, they just are so passionate about making sure that you understand the islands. Of course, um, the boat itself is lovely. I can't tell you how many hours I spent um, during our siesta time after lunch out here on on the sun deck, just taking in the landscapes. Uh, like Rick said, the photography is amazing. Um, even when you're not on the islands themselves getting photos of the, of the wildlife, there are such diverse landscapes that you see as you go through the Galapagos. And um, especially if you are there uh, sort of later in the year, this time of year, there are some great places where you can whale watch from the boat. And on a recent trip uh, with Bowie, folks were even lucky enough to see blue whales, um, which is just incredible, the, the videos on our website. I'm just running through a few pictures to let you see what the cabins look like. Um, again, they are extremely spacious. This is actually your cabin, Rick. Um, I think you have. You know, great storage, full-size bathroom, which you don't always get on a small ship cruise. And then I had to laugh. It's the little touches that the crew does with the towel art. And 
um, it just made me laugh that Rick, you actually shot all of your towel art. I, did, I, I may have missed one of them because I needed a towel real quick. <laughs> but um, no, I love it. Like the one in the left center is, I think that's supposed to be a booby. Then I mean, they did like the Galapagos animals, you know, some of the things that we see. But it was very creative, things that I've never seen. I've seen a lot of you know, folded towels that look like animals, but um, they were certainly some of the most creative that I've ever experienced. So I had to take a photo. <laughs> of course, the food on board is delicious. And Rick, you were sharing with me, you had kind of hoped that on this trip it would be so active that it would be the first trip ever where you didn't gain weight. Uh, yes. I don't think you made it. Uh, I don't think you were so lucky. I didn't. No, I wasn't. I, I actually, I maintained. I mean, I was probably most active on this trip as I'd ever been because I was like a little kid just wanting to run and do everything. And I thought, there's no way I can gain weight. But the, the food was so good. You know, they had um, most meals. They will have some local Ecuadorian cuisine, but then they'll also have, you know, something for everybody. And, of course, I ate both. And one of my favorite dishes was uh, ceviche. This is a, a photo of uh, some ceviche they have. And the Ecuadorians put um, popcorn and plantain chips and corn nuts in it just to kind of give it a little contrast and texture. And I thought that was kind of weird, but I saw they were doing it, so I decided I would try it on mine. And, oh, it was so good, so good. Um, the fish, fish, the seafood was so fresh. Um, we pulled up to a boat uh, one day, and they just bought it from some fishermen. They caught it there that day, and you know we had it for dinner that night. And the, the chefs are so creative with um, everything, everything they made. It, uh, yeah, you wouldn't. I've never heard of Galapagos as a destination for food, but uh, that ship ship certainly was. <laughs> Um, one of the other great features aboard the Evolution is the library and lecture space. Um, the lounge area that you're looking at right here is where we have our nightly briefings um, aboard the Evolution, and that's one of the fantastic educational components of the journey. Is that each night the naturalists give you, you know, a briefing. It's 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 not extremely intense educationally, but you're learning a lot about the history, the wildlife, the geology of the islands, and of course you're usually sipping a delicious cocktail while you do it, which makes it all the more enjoyable. This is one of the shots of the fantastic bar and top deck, and when you come back from your journey, there's almost always a fabulous fruit juice and a great snack waiting for you up here on this deck. But it's also just a comfortable place to sit and relax. Um, if you want to bring up a book, that was certainly popular. And of course, in the evenings, we would have a drink and just chat with your fellow travelers. That is one of the benefits to having no more than 32 guests on the evolution, is that you really get to know the people that you travel with. Um, which is a real treat just to get to know such a diverse group of people. And of course, you make you know, lifelong friends. We uh, and I, I think you've kept up with some of your fellow travelers, Rick. But we have people with international expeditions who have met on the journeys, um, who continue now to travel together on other small group trips. I don't blame them. Yeah, I, I made some good friends on that trip. That's one of the things I love about the small group travel and. You know, the little uh, bar up top, um, that was, we, I got some of the most fantastic sunset pictures that I've ever taken. Like every day, the sunrise and sunsets were just beautiful out there. And um, that's where I was able to take a lot of the photos, right up there. Um, just a little bit more detail. As you go island to island, you go in Zodiac. And we have three zodiacs so that when you're out with your naturalist, you're in your small group. And um, we have both dry landings where you're getting off directly onto rock. It's very easy. Um, you know, they have someone there to help you get off and on the uh, zodiac. And then there's also wet landings, a few of those where you just uh, swing over to the side and, and wade through the water to get up onto the beach or the island you're visiting. Um, 
very easy, typically waters just just a few inches deep. Um, of course, right now we have Galapagos departure dates um, for 16 and 17. You can get a sense, but it's almost every month. Um, and then we have fantastic ways to see more of South America by adding on extensions to Guayaquil, Quito, the Ecuadorian Amazon, and Machu Picchu and Cusco. So there's Obviously, all of that detail can be found on our website at ietravel.com slash Galapagos. And I'll, I'll get through that very quickly so that we have plenty of time for questions. Um, we have just released our 16 and 17 catalog, which you can order online. But I wanted to take a moment. Um, there are questions building up that I, I haven't gotten to all of them, and I know people are asking lots of questions to Rick. So I just wanted to open up our session now to questions. Again, the question box is over on the right-hand side um, of your screen. You can type in there. And let me just read some of these questions. Um, Rick Sandy is asking, do you have to be super adventurous to enjoy the Galapagos Islands? No, they have cocktails, so <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Uh, no, um, it, it's you can kind of go at your own pace on what you want to. I think you'll become more adventurous just doing it just because you'll be so excited about um, all the things that you're going to see and the nature. But um, most, you know, I'm an old guy. Most of the people on the, my particular trip were, were older than I was, but they were putting on the wetsuits, jumping in the water, going for these hikes. And I think you're just so fascinated by everything. Um, nothing was really strenuous, so um, you you would definitely love it. If you love wildlife particularly, um, this is a bucket list trip. Someone asked just very briefly which ship the journey is on, and we're aboard the 32 Guest Evolution. I apologize if I did not if I did not mention that frequently enough. Um, someone else asked, and, and Rick, you can address this, but on your trip, how did they divide the groups up for the daily excursions? Um, for the most part, we didn't work with a regular group all the time. It's like we had uh, two pangas that would go out, and it's whoever got there first. You know, it's just said, okay, we're ready to load, and you just, you know, kind of make your way. And, you, you know, everybody became friends with everybody on this trip, so it, it really didn't matter. Usually a husband and wife would like to stay together. You know, but um, yeah, there wasn't anything particular as far as the way they divided them up. Uh, it seems like maybe one or two times they may have had something that um, this group's going to go on a little longer hike or a more strenuous hike, and you know, the other group won't. We'll go on a shorter one. So that may have happened once or twice, but uh, for the most part, it's just get out there and go. <laughs> Lynn has asked if there are any opportunities to kayak. Yes, there are. Um, I think I only went kayaking one day. Um, we got real close to the, the shore where we, I was trying to get a picture of a, a bull seal, and he just he barked so loud. I mean, you, he didn't want me there for, for some reason. But, yeah, you can definitely kayak and see turtles as well. Several people have asked about the best time of year to visit the Galapagos, and really I will say that it depends on um, sort of what you're looking for out of the experience. Now, as we pointed out earlier, there is almost always something mating. There are almost always babies of different, um, different species. Um, I will say that in terms of underwater visibility, uh, some of your best months for underwater visibility are going to be May, June, but I will say that with the caveat, it's the best underwater visibility because that's when the currents that bring the nutrients are the weakest. So when you look more toward the fall months, um, when the Humboldt current, the Carmel current are the strongest and they're bringing the most nutrients, the water the visibility isn't as good and the water is colder, but that's also when the wildlife is the most active. 
Um, so, you know, there's almost never, I will say, a bad time to go to Galapagos. If you have something in particular that you want to see in terms of, you know, you want to see the way Dalbatross is on Espanola or uh, you really want to be there during whale watching season, um, give us a call and we can talk through what your specific expectations are and help you find the best departure. But there is never a bad time to go to Galapagos. Um, some of the other questions um, were about weather and rough seas. And again, that varies. Um, I will say the seas, have, when I've been, have never been particularly rough. But it's hard to sort of say there are no rough seas. Um, and the weather stays fairly consistent temperature-wise because you are right on the equator. Um, I will say that when I, the last time I went, it was in November, and I was surprised that it was a little bit cooler, actually, than I expected, having been to other equatorial destinations like the Amazon Rainforest. Rick, what was your experience with the weather and the temperatures? Uh, the, the weather was great. Um, we didn't had a couple of little rainy days, but the weather was warm, and we were comfortable uh, the whole time. I think, like you said, you're, you're at the equator. We crossed the equator twice. So you're not really going to get cold. Um, the water for uh, snorkeling was great uh, and relaxing. And I felt it was therapeutic, <laughs> and I was there in February. So um, I, I think it's, like you said, it's probably not a bad time to go. Um, there were a few other questions that people asked about sort of nuts and bolts. Um, there are no required in immunizations. And of course, uh, you know there are no visas that you need to purchase in advance. So Ecuador is a really nice, easy destination to get around in in terms of uh, the traveling logistics. But what makes it even easier is that their official currency is the U.S. dollar. Let's see, I'm trying to just run through questions right here again. If you have any questions um, that you'd like answered please type them in the box over to the right. Again, the best time for whale watching um, is one of the specific questions we have, and that's actually um, our fall month. So this time of year, your uh, October, November, it is when the water and the Cromwell current, the Humboldt current, the, those cooler uh, currents that make it possible for penguins to live on the equator, that's when they're the strongest, and of course the whales are following those nutrients. Um, it looks like we have gotten through most of the questions. Um, so I will say, um, Rick, I'll just open the floor to you if there's any final comments or thoughts that you wanted to that you wanted to add. Yeah, I just want to say this was my uh, first experience with international expeditions, and everything just from you know I live in Atlanta from get me from Atlanta to Miami to Guayaquil to the hotel and then to the Galapagos and back home. I mean, I didn't have to think, which is good for me. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate the, the job that you did, the attention to detail, um, the guide's knowledge of everything. I love the nightly briefings. I didn't really jump in, chime in on that. But, um, you know, we kind of reviewed what we saw during the day, and then we talked about what we're going to do for the next day so we could be prepared and um, it was just the experience was so wonderful if Bowley had been my ninth grade science teacher I probably would have majored in science you know <laughs> so um, just thank you for a wonderful once in a lifetime experience um, there are a few more logistic questions that have popped up and I just want to let you guys know that we will um, answer those offline since we're right at an hour now. Um, if there are any things at all that come up that you would like to discuss or any questions that don't get answered in the next day or so, you are, of course, welcome to call our, uh, our offices at 800-234-9620. Or you can reach me directly. Again, my name is Emily, and my email address is e. Harley, E-H-A-R-L-E-Y, at ietravel.com. Or, of course, if you reach out at nature at ietravel.com, 
any of our staff would be more than happy to talk to you. So Rick, thank you so much for joining us. It was great. Uh, just sharing your perspective about the experience, and everyone, we appreciate you staying with us this evening. Yeah, thank you. And with Have that, we will say good evening and conclude our webinar. Goodbye.